Hello, this is Anthony Chadwick from the Webinar Vet. Just wanted to share this recording from the virtual conference uh, of Mike Hertage discussing a uh, Labrador retriever with an abdominal problem and how he was able to work it up using diagnostic imaging. Mike is a wizard at all of these areas and of course a great internal medicine specialist as well as dermatologist as well. So fascinating cases. He sees things that uh, uh, vets like me just don't get to see on, on uh, a, a diagnostic imaging, um, x-ray or ultrasound. So I hope you enjoy it. It is free for you. If you'd like to buy the whole Virtual Congress 2021, which was over 100 hours of just fantastic CPD, the link is down below. Please do go and have a look at it and... Uh, Hopefully see you on one of those webinars very soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone, for uh, rejoining this uh, final session for me of uh, uh, abdominal imaging. So the first case uh, we're going to present is uh, a Labrador retriever, six-year-old male neutered called Galaxy. And the history with Galaxy is that uh, uh, he had been intermittently vomiting for about two weeks. Uh, waxing and waning sort of course, but becoming uh, more um, uh, continuous. And, and more recently, that was uh, associated with uh, cranial abdominal pain. So I'm going to show you uh, the radiographs uh, from, uh, um, from this dog. Um, here's the lateral. This is the right lateral. There are differences between the right and the left lateral. They're not quite as marked as they are with the thorax, uh, but particularly the position of the uh, kidneys in the right lateral, the right kidney, which is always cranial to the left, will move further forwards because the uh, normal contents move further forwards under the weight of the uh, abdominal contents. And the ventrodorsal. We take the ventrodorsal because... Uh, <coughs> The uh, animal is uh, easier to position uh, often in the ventrodorsal uh, projection and certainly the abdomen will spread out, allowing us to visualize more uh, organs than we can in a dorsal ventral where the abdomen tends to hang more uh, underneath the uh, lumbar spine. So the question from, uh, from me is, what is your diagnosis? Is this normal? Was there hepatic enlargement? Was there intestinal obstruction, ascites or peritonitis? So again, we'll give people a, a chance to vote on that, Mike, but perhaps if you just go back yep. over those so two slides there, again. There's the ventrodorsal. And there's the lateral. So it looks like Mike, 25% think it's normal. 17% think there is some hepatic enlargement. 25% are potential um, intestinal obstruction. And then 33% saying peritonitis. Okay, well, let's uh, have a look and see uh, what uh, we make of it. So on the lateral view, <laughs> first of all, um, what can we see? Well, here's the diaphragm. We haven't got the whole of the diaphragm. But those of you who said liver enlargement, here's the liver coming down, just extending to the costal arch. This is spleen, if you were worried what that was. This is the liver. And it's got quite a narrow angle to the ventral lobe of the liver. So the liver would be considered to be normal. We can also associate it with the axis of the stomach, uh, here is the gas within the fundus on the left-hand side, down to the pylorus, which is full of fluid on the right-hand side. We draw a line bisecting the fundus and the, uh, the uh, uh, pylorus, then it more or less follows the line of that overlying rib. So we wouldn't really say that that was likely to be associated with, uh, um, with, with uh, hepatic enlargement. The kidneys are dorsal, as I pointed out before. Uh, they're about uh, two and a half times the length of the body of L2, which would be a normal. 
uh, slightly rounder in the left kidney because the left kidney will sort of flop down so you get a slightly different uh, appearance of the kidney. Then in the caudal abdomen, we've got the uh, bladder, which is uh, full of uh, urine or at least a soft tissue opacity in the shape of the bladder, so it's likely to contain uh, urine. As I mentioned, we have um, uh, spleen down here. Uh, but then the most striking feature to me is this sort of uh, wispiness uh, of the uh, background. Now, if you think about uh, what causes the contrast in the abdomen, most of the contrast is caused by intra-abdominal fat, which of course is radiolucent compared to soft tissue. And that usually gives us very clearly defined borders uh, of the serosa, except in young animals or very thin animals where there's very little intra-abdominal fat. And yet where we see the fat down here, we can see this streaking uh, of a soft tissue opacity, and this will be uh, fluid uh, percolating through the uh, uh, fat uh, around the uh, spleen, around the small intestine, uh, around the large intestine that we can see there. And that loss of serosal detail with this sort of mottled appearance is really typical of peritonitis. So those of you who said peritonitis were uh, correct. Um, ascites would usually have a lot more fluid and so we lose this mottling and it just becomes a uh, ground glass appearance to the abdomen with gas within the intestines showing up uh, as uh, loosened areas. We don't see the fat. Now when we look also closely at these uh, levels we can perhaps make out there's some little spots that could actually be almost gas opacity within that uh, uh, fluid and fat. Um, so again, that would uh, tend to um, implicate the possibility that this has uh, ascites. Similar changes uh, on the ventrodorsal. Uh, here we can see the, uh, uh, the, the uh, colon coming up from the uh, uh, pelvic uh, inlet coming around to the ileocecal colic junction here. There's the curl of the cecum. Uh, the ileum comes off from there. So we can see a uh, small intestine, but it's not really clear and it's lost its clarity because uh, of that small amount of fluid and that mottled appearance within the uh, fat. Stomach comes across here, so fundus is over on the left-hand side, pylorus on the right-hand side. Then we have duodenum. Duodenum is always the most lateral uh, uh, part of the small intestine coming, usually as a fairly straight line, cordially, and it'll flex and come cranially up to the stomach, and then after that it becomes the uh, uh, ileum, oh, sorry, the jejunum, uh, and then finally the uh, ileum. So, what I would say from this is that uh, it looks as though this animal has uh, peritonitis. Uh, and we could show that up in this particular dog by doing a decubitus lateral. Uh, and so when we lie the animal on its left hand side, uh, leave it there for a few moments for the gas that is free within the abdomen to percolate up, then we can see this gas cap which is outside the uh, intestines or the stomach uh, around here or the liver. Uh, there's a free gas cap uh, underneath the uh, rib cage there. And of course it percolates up there because that's the highest part uh, of the abdomen. So uh, it goes to the highest part and the uh, uh, abdominal structures fall away from the abdominal wall in that situation. So ultrasound is also good for showing up uh, peritonitis. What we tend to see a number of different ultrasonographic uh, signs. Uh, here we can see a picture of the abdomen that's probably spleen uh, across here. But the striking feature is that the mesentery is really, really bright. 
It's very hyperechoic. We can see perhaps loops of bowel uh, there, another abdominal structure here. This may be uh, bladder, for example, but the uh, surrounding uh, area of mesentery is really, really bright. And that is typical of having a small amount of fluid or inflammatory reaction within the, uh, uh, within the mesentery. And then if we look and wait long enough, we will find in the dependent uh, area of the uh, abdomen that we find some fluid accumulation. Now, this fluid is not going to be uh, anechoic because it's got uh, cells within it in peritonitis, uh, inflammatory cells, maybe even uh, free bacteria and bacteria within the white cells as well. But we can identify a little locus uh, of fluid accumulation uh, close to the uh, spleen and this particular view. But you have to hunt around to find these little pockets. And once you've found a pocket, then of course you could put a needle uh, in uh, to that uh, pocket under ultrasound guidance. You'll see the end of the needle and uh, you'll usually be able to collect some fluid uh, from uh, that little pocket. But as we looked around the rest of the abdomen, we were able to identify the uh, duodenum coming from the stomach. And the duodenum had this consistent defect uh, within the wall. You can see another picture here with that same uh, defect with the intestinal contents coming right deep into that um, cleft within the uh, duodenal wall. And this was considered to be likely a duodenal ulcer that is ruptured. Uh, the bright mesentery uh, from the peritonitis will have then tried to wall off uh, that leakage. Um, but of course, the uh, inflammatory fluid uh, will be causing no end of uh, problems. The duodenum looks uh, fairly um, uh, uh, abnormal in this situation here. Normally it's quite a straight organ, but you can see that it's rather uh, tortuous <clears throat> and that can usually go along with uh, inflammation either within the duodenum or surrounding the duodenum. And we can follow the duodenum up to the pylorus. That's just the pyloric antrum there, uh, which is uh, open and you can see some ingester coming into the uh, uh, duodenum. The pancreas also looked uh, slightly odd. Now, some of this will be because of the peritonitis that's uh, around. So we've got these very bright focal spots uh, within the uh, structure uh, of the uh, uh, pancreas. It's, it's slightly more hyperechoic than the normal. We know that it's uh, pancreas from its position. This is the right limb of the pancreas. There's duodenum. There's the... Uh, uh, pancreatico, uh, uh, the duodenal, pancreatico duodenal vein uh, coming along parallel to the uh, duodenum that allows us to identify that. But when we look in cross section again, we can see more normal pancreas, but with these hyperechoic uh, areas within it. And these may well be associated with some uh, scarring uh, associated with the uh, change uh, of the inflammation. So the pancreas uh, doesn't look uh, normal. It's got some uh, uh, rather uh, uh, undulating edges to the uh, organ itself. Uh, so we would be worried about uh, pancreatitis. So pancreatitis could, of course, cause a duodenal ulcer or the duodenal ulcer could start leaking and causing pancreatitis. Anyway, this is the fluid we got off and uh, you can see that it's very turbid. Um, it's quite... Uh, uh, blood stain, we can't uh, uh, see clearly through uh, the fluid. Uh, it contains uh, active white cells with intracellular bacteria, <coughs> which always means that uh, you have uh, uh, peritonitis uh, present and that that requires immediate surgery. Uh, and at surgery, there was indeed a ruptured duodenal ulcer. That area of bowel was resected the uh, peritoneum cavity was flushed and actually the dog made a very good recovery. 
Uh, it had been on non-steroid anti-inflammatories and probably uh, that didn't help the um, ulcer or maybe have actually caused the ulceration within the duodenum. Are you a vet or a nurse, vet nurse or a veterinary student or a veterinary nurse student? If you're any of those things, then please do go over and look at our uh, platform, thewebinarvet.com and Wikivet as well. Some great resources on there. Join the very big community that we have on the platform and we'd love to see you on a webinar or looking at some of the great student resources on the Wikivet website.